about soccer, mental toughness, and life. I'm your host, Brandon Stone. My guest today, David Vadrill. Did I pronounce that right? Yeah, Vodrill. Yeah. Vodrill. All right. David, uh, I knew him through a friend of mine named Shannon. She introduced me to him, said he's a great soccer guy and a great person. So I've reached out to him. He uh, is now out in Florida. He just bought a UPSL team and he runs That's an academy correct. and he runs an academy out there that he built from the top down <clears throat> um, out of a private school the name of the school again was St. Stephen's Episcopal St. Stephen's Episcopal all right that's where he's running his uh, club out of and he also coaches the varsity girls team at that school um, David thanks for coming on how are you doing today I'm doing great. I survived uh, two morning sessions with a lot of Florida rain, and now I'm heading up to do uh, do another semi-pro conquistador session up in the Bradenton area tonight. All right. So uh, it's oh. raining, raining pretty hard down in Florida right now. Yeah, just uh, the tail end of that hurricane, I say, us, that came through. You know, not that we don't have rain all the time, but you can tell it's a little little colder. But we missed on the West Coast here. We didn't really have any any problems with the hurricane. Uh, you know, it's heading up towards Carolina now. But in general, the weather's been good here. We got a little bit of rain. That was it. Good deal. Good deal. Um, nothing beats some good old Florida weather. Um, before I jump back into how you got into soccer, give me a brief rundown of what you're doing now with the academy and the UPSL club. So I did a three-year deal with St. Stephen's to be their varsity girls head coach. And in return, they gave me a three-year deal to use the stadium and the training facility. So as my base, St. Stephen's, I'll build from the, from the top down, the UPSL first division team. <clears throat> you know, I'll have professional players and amateur players, a first team, a reserve team, and an under-19 team. And then I have a typical youth soccer club, you know, anywhere from four and five year olds up to 17, 18 year olds. Uh, but we also have a partnership with World Sport Academy in Barcelona. They have a residential soccer academy in Barcelona. So we are now their residential soccer academy partner in Bradenton. So kids could come in from anywhere in the world go to St. Stephen's and then change, train with my club, my uh, residential academy and my pro academy year round. Now, when you say Barcelona, are you talking about the club Barcelona or just the city? In this city. So the people that I'm uh, using are involved directly with Cornea, which is a professional team uh, that just got promoted from the third division, to the second division and Espanol, which is, uh, you know, the second biggest club behind FC Barcelona. They actually, I think, just got relegated, uh, but they've been in La Liga historically almost all the time. Uh, and they're all in the same complex along with World Sport Academy. So very close ties to all three organizations. Oh, awesome, awesome. Have you uh, made the trip over there to visit their facility? Yes, that, you know, I got over there, I got introduced to them, I met with them, I went over for about 10 days and uh, did the whole nine yards. Went to Espanol's game, their stadium's right there, 48,000 people, went toward all of Cornea's stadium and their facilities, and then uh, the CEO of World Sport Academy, I, he, Alex Bosacoma, he toured me his academy, but he's also the reserve team coach for Cornea. So, uh, you know, these teams, in Barcelona, their academies are soccer machines. You know, they put factories, they put out, Cornea has put out, I'd say a hundred kids in the last five years that have been transferred to Espanol, Atletico Madrid, Real Madrid, Barcelona, all the big clubs in Spain. 
uh, you know, these guys, they know how to do youth soccer. So in my mind, that was a target for me. I want, my deal is I'm bringing two UEFA pro coaches who've been doing youth soccer development for the last 15, 20 years, and I'm bringing them here to work full time with me here in Florida. Awesome. How did you find those coaches? Uh, just through contacts in the soccer world. I, a year and a half ago, I spent uh, nine days in Madrid with Rayo Vallecano, who I had been their assistant coach for their NASL team in Oklahoma City. And then uh, a couple of months later, I went back to Barcelona for 10 days. And, uh, you know, contacts that I already had, but I went out there physically to visit and, uh, and really get to know the people and start a working relationship. Awesome. I'm, I'm always uh, curious to learn how um, people get where they get in their career in the soccer world. Um, a lot of it's just luck and a lot of it's who you know and networking and a lot of it is just letting your work um, speak for yourself. So, um, so before this academy you're running, you're at the uh, Tulsa Roughnecks, correct? That's right. I was there for two years. How did you get that job to begin with? So it was with uh, Ryo Viacano. Viacano is, uh, I think you'd say it's the third most prestigious professional team in Madrid. They had an NASL team in Oklahoma City. Uh, I was brought in to be their assistant coach. And through that experience down there and the job we did down there, I, I got to the uh, attention of the ownership group and management group of the Tulsa Roughnecks. And right after we finished uh, the season that I was at Rio Viacano, uh, I came up and interviewed with Tulsa and was offered the head coaching job about a week or so later. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, are you originally from the Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma area? Or? No, I'm from Connecticut. So I had been in Connecticut doing youth soccer, my own soccer academy. I had been an assistant coach with the New England Revolution. I'm going to have to rewind you just a second. You cut out there. Um, you're, you said you were the assistant coach for New England Revolution. And then? Yes, I, I was in Connecticut running my own club. Uh, I was uh, assistant coach with the New England Revolution for a year. And that's when I started pursuing the pro jobs again. And I got the assistant coaching with uh, Oklahoma City. And uh, I was fortunate enough to jump and got the head coaching job in Tulsa. What was it like growing up in Connecticut? What was the process of falling in love with soccer as a kid? How did that all work and play out for you? Yeah, you know, I grew up in a suburb outside in the west suburbs outside of Hartford in a school that was small enough that we didn't have a, a high school football program. So all the kids played soccer in the fall. So that was, you know, I was playing everything. I played varsity baseball, basketball, soccer. I played ice hockey. You know, I golfed and played tennis most of the year and in the summers. Uh, but I really gravitated to hockey and soccer and Somewhere around sophomore year in high school, I was like, okay, I want to be a pro hockey player or a pro soccer player. And for no good reason, I decided I, this is when the NASL was still around in 1982, 1981. Uh, I said, okay, I'm going to be a, a – I kept playing the other varsity sports in high school, but I stopped playing hockey to focus on soccer. And Of course, the NASL folded two years later, and the NHL took off. Gretzky just – came into the league and, you know, somewhat bad timing on my spot, my, on my part, uh, you know, I end up going to Princeton University, but there's no pro soccer league anymore. And I haven't played hockey in two and a half, three years. So the outlook for my pro career wasn't great. You know, when I graduated college, I, on uh, Bruce Arena's recommendation, I went down to Washington, D.C. and tried out for the Washington Stars. Uh, John Sen John Kerr Sr. was the head coach. We trained on a uh, a big field.
filled out in uh, Fort Belvoir, the Army base, and practiced a couple times a night and played on the weekends for 120 bucks a game. So it was not a glamorous start to uh, my pro soccer career, but seven years later, MLS came back around, and I was fortunate enough to play for another seven years. Now, I know you played for DC United. Is that correct? Yeah. My first two years with DC United, 96 and 97, uh, I, I hadn't been drafted by them. I was drafted by the Galaxy, but I was on loan to the Baltimore Blast in the indoor leagues. And by the time we got knocked out of the playoffs, the Galaxy released me because I never made it to preseason. I missed the entire preseason, missed the first four or five games of the season, and just kind of uh, lucked into getting a quick three-day loan with DC United and they brought me back and uh you know took me about a week or two to win a starting position and I signed signed to a full contract with DC United. So as you're as you're playing pro back then do you have in mind kind of looking ahead that you want to be a coach or are you just so focused on your career you're gonna like I'll deal with that later once it once the once that fork in the road gets here. I, I, you know, in my mind, after being associated with uh, Chicago Fire, Colorado Rapids, that were owned by the Anschutz Entertainment Group, we got to spend a lot of time with uh, Mr. Anschutz and some of his uh, top people. You know, I was kind of watching the model of how they were doing it, build a stadium, wrap a real estate development around it, you know, and I was like, Definitely the growth curve of soccer is huge. Obviously, I love the sport, focused my whole life on it since I was about 13 years old. And uh, coaching, I thought, was the first launching pad. So I definitely wanted to be a coach. I started taking the license and started to prepare. But also, you know, always had in my mind that I wanted to be a part of a management group or an ownership group that builds a stadium and uh, and buys a pro franchise. and try to turn it into, uh, you know, a championship franchise with a big fan following and a big fan base. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Did you start taking those coaching um, classes or start preparing for your license while you were still a pro player, or did you wait till you were done? Uh, I, just, just before my last year, I signed up for the first license that – as a pro player, you take a B license. I took the B right after I got out. And then a couple of years later, I took the last two years. I took the, the new in the world that happened. That was, uh, but yeah, I started right before I retired. Started taking the licenses. I started, you know, collaborating with other coaches and, and really training and studying and to be a to be a professional coach. Very cool, very cool. I didn't know if you had time back then to to juggle both things. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the the mental side of the game. Um, what do you feel like were some of your mental qualities or characteristics that made you successful as a player and then later on as a coach? Well, as a, as a player, you know, there's, there's two factors. Obviously, you have to have some natural ability, right? You can train that. You can get a little bit faster. You get quicker and stronger. But, you know, the real two things are how mentally tough are you? How much do you want it? How much are you willing to sacrifice? And what are you willing to do to get better? And, uh, you know, how much of a student of the game are you? You know, it's um, what can you learn every time you step on the field? You know, you play against Roberto Donadoni with the Metro Stars. You play against Ricardo Alonso with Fort Lauderdale Strikers. You play against, uh, you know, some of the best players in the world. I played with Marco Echeverri, Carlos Valderrama, uh, you know, Christo Stoichkov, some huge, huge names in world football. And the question is, can you learn from them? Can you adapt and be able to step on the same field with them and prove that? Not only are you a good player, but you're good enough to play with them and and uh, and be successful 
and help the team win win games and win championships. So, you know, I think it's men- mental toughness it's, and that determination to do whatever it takes to win is the number one ingredient. You know, there's plenty of people that were bigger and faster and stronger and maybe some that had a, a little more talent than me. But, uh, you know, I played for four years of college and 14 years as a pro and it's the whole the whole mental package. Are you willing to stay healthy, stay fit, always get better, train every day for 10, 11, 11 and a half months out of the year and continually push the envelope and figure out how you can get better. What kept you going when your body wanted to quit? Well, fortunately, I never had that problem. I'm pretty injury free. I had one ACL surgery early on but I came back from it in the first six months and then played for another 13 years. So, you know, I always liked to train, so I never had any problem. It was never a grind. I liked to cross train. I liked to get in the gym. I liked to do the running and the sports and the lifting and the stretching and the yoga and the Tai Chi, all that stuff. Uh, so, it was never that itself to be able to compete with the best players possible. You know, that was the motivation. It was, I really, you know, the, it's not the championships for me. It's the fact that I can call up Marco Echeverry today. And, you know, we're very close because we were close on the field. And uh, for me, those guys being accepted by those guys who played in world cups, who are international superstars, you know, when we're all in the field, you're either able to do it or you can't. And it's very obvious to everybody right away who can play and who can't play. So, you know, I was never the star. I never scored a ton of goals and that, but no matter what team we're at, whatever position I was playing, you know, I was, I was always a starter. I was always on the field and, uh, you know, earning the respect to your teammates and your coaches, that's the number one kind of uh, feedback, the, the, the grat- gratification that you get. You know, play, playing in front of 60,000 fans live on ABC at RFK Stadium and winning a championship, that's not too bad either. But mm-hmm. I also went to the times when you're playing at a high school in front of 300 kids and you're getting paid $120. That, that part, the competition, it doesn't matter what, what, the, what the reward is at the end. That's, in the end, it's, you love the sport, you want to compete, you want to always test yourself against the best possible. Yeah, uh, being on, you know, in that elite category of players is, is definitely something that's, you know, a lot of people try and not a lot of people succeed at. So I can see how just like, you know, being able to hold your own with with those top players is, is definitely something to to admire um, and and to be proud of for you. For sure, because uh, I know a lot of people who wanted to go pro or tried and didn't. So, um, so yeah, you, can... you know, I was I was willing. You know, in some respects, I was lucky because, you know, I was twenty eight, twenty nine when MLS started. Most of the guys had dropped out and were like, "Okay, I'm gonna ra- get a fam- get married and have a family, or I'm gonna start the next career." I was still enjoying the lifestyle. I was still able to sign with some high level teams and, and I knew the MLS was coming down the horizon and I was like, I'm ready to go. And when it came, of course it was the wild west. You know, everyone was, there were no real rules. The contracts didn't mean anything. Uh, but I was fortunate. I played another seven years. I didn't really retire until my, I was 37. So that was the big reward for the first seven years of, you know, indoors here, outdoors there, back and forth, you know, professional teams, but not anywhere near the level of what Major League Soccer was then or what it is now, of course. So, uh, you know, I, I look, I feel like I was very fortunate, but I also, we all, you know, those guys in my era, we really earned it. You know, we, we were sleeping on couches. We were traveling around, trying out with every team and every alphabet every alphabet soup league you can think of, you know, (laughs) indoor leagues here, indoor leagues in Mexico, semi-pro leagues, full pro leagues, major league soccer, you know, then you, next thing you know, you're playing against Morelia in, in uh, Mexico against 
CONCACAF uh, teams in the CONCACAF Champions League. So that kind of stuff was exciting. Well, in that, on that um, side, how do you keep going if, like, you, you know, I'm sure you tried out at several places and got rejected. What keeps you from saying, oh, you know what, maybe I'm just not cut out for it and walking away? You know, I think it's, it's two things. Number one, you just want it and you have a desire and you, you're, you're willing to sacrifice you know, physically and mentally and commit yourself to the lifestyle. Um, but also I think it was when, you know, when you train so hard, you know, when you step on the field, if you're prepared or not. So I never had any doubt. I mean, there was only, you know, a month here, a month there when I didn't start every game, every minute of every game, you know, at the very end of the first year in DC United, uh, I did not play every game in the playoffs. And then the off season, I had the best off season of my life. And then from that point on, you know, I won the job outright and played every minute of every game for the next six years, you know, but in general, it's a question of, do you believe that you can do it? If you're not good enough in certain areas, are you willing to take the time and really do whatever it takes mentally you know, that your speed of thought and decision-making and the physical aspects, the skill, the technique, uh, you know, the speed and the endurance to do it over 90 minutes for, you know, 10 months out of the year. Uh, but I think you, when you step on the field, you know if you're in shape, you know if your level is good enough, you know if you're mentally tough enough, you know if you can stand the pressure. And every time I stepped on the field, I always thought, I'm completely ready. I'm going to go out and have a great game. I'm going to do not just my job, but I'll do everything possible to help my team win. And in the end, I think that's what coaches saw in me. You know, on any given team, D.C. United, they brought me in as a right back. Uh, Colorado Rapids as a right back, left back, defensive center midfielder, basically a stopper to, to cover the other team's number 10. Go to Miami, and I'm playing the left wing back, or left wing in a 3-5-2. You know, I trained as a center midfielder my whole life, but I could do it all. I could, I could mark up. I could play stopper. I could play left back, right back, left wing, right wing, attacking midfielder, defensive midfielder. So, you know, I had the, the ability and the skill set to be invaluable to my team. Whatever they needed, they knew they could put me in there and I could be a starter and make that position my own and, and, and always win my battles and, and do multiple different things to help the team win. You're kind of like the, the switch army knife. Yeah. Swiss Army Knight, sorry. Yeah, it's all about an, an attitude, though. In soccer, it doesn't matter what position you're playing. You either want the ball or you don't want the ball. When you get the ball, maybe you're 15 yards further up the field or 15 yards back on the field. But I always played with an attacking mentality. You know, at D.C. United, I had full reign to overlap Tony Sané and go all the way to the end line, which I did taught you know over and over and over ago every game every minute of every game you know so it's it was never a question of oh you're a defender or you're only a, a defensive midfielder you're this or you're that when you're on the field you're just a soccer player you go out you have to win your one-on-one -on -one battles and then you've got to you know I took it like I wanted the ball every time yeah. you know in Chicago Fire Zach Thornton every time he got the ball in his hands he'd throw it to me I was you know, we talk about building out of the back. He threw the ball to me 35 yards out, and I took it up and helped us penetrate into the into the, the middle third of the field. So, you know, I never looked at myself like I was in a limited role. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, I'm going to rewind you a little bit. You spoke about belief, and, you know, you have to have the belief. And um, I know sometimes, like for these younger players, they sometimes struggle with having that belief. And I know me personally, when I was like in high school, um, I asked my coach, you know, I, I grew I went to high school in Brazil and uh, I'd asked my coach, you know, do you think I'm good enough to come play in the uh, college ball in the U S and like, had he have said, no, I would have given up. So like, how can we help these kids to not need that external validation and just you know 
or if there's bad external, you know, people talk bad about you to ignore it and just keep that belief going that yes, you can do it. Any words right. of advice yeah. there? Yeah, you know, I think that when I see kids that are playing youth soccer at any age or any level, the hard thing, which no one is giving kids the right mentality and character is when they start out behind the curve. You know, in, in American soccer today, if a kid hasn't been playing in an organized uh, situation and all of a sudden he starts and he's two or three years behind, they're not getting the, the training and the instruction and the encouragement to stick it out until they improve. Eventually you'll catch up. But it's very hard. You know, you get an eight or nine year old kid who can barely trap a ball and doesn't understand the game yet and just cannot keep up with kids who've been playing for three, four, five years. And the, the support structure is not there for them to be like, first of all, they're not being trained correctly and they're not put in the right environment. But it's very difficult because they get discouraged. And it doesn't matter what anyone says to them, they realize I can't compete. And I think that's one of the hardest things that makes kids drop out but the bottom line is you know my dad was my baseball basketball coach he didn't know the first thing about soccer or hockey so like every other kid out there I didn't have a lot of guidance I didn't have an agent to tell me hey don't go to this school go to that school don't go try out here try here you know a lot of it is uh you know you learn on your own but you got to go out there and be aggressive. You got to go find the best situation possible and compete against the best players possible. You know, the best thing for me was I had a late birthday and I was very young and I was always able to play up against guys two, three, four years older than me. You know, that ability to compete against guys that are bigger and faster. Now, if you're not there and you're behind the curve, you just got to have that mental. If you love the sport, I, you know, I think there's nothing more rewarding than putting your mind to something like, I know if I work hard, I'm going to get better. You know, and that's the big reward. You know, when you start a new soccer club, you're not, you're not bringing a youth soccer club. You're not bringing in the top players, the A and B players. You're taking in the, the B minus the C players and you've got to train them just as hard as you train a pro player. And when they really improve rapidly and all of a sudden they're competing with the B players and the competing with the A players, then Hopefully that's the spark that they need. But, you know, as a kid, you've got to be, you know, and like any game, you make tons of mistakes, you win, you lose. You've got to look at it like that's a motivating thing. I think it's, it's motivation. You know, there's something to be said for competition. Good, good, clean, hard, fun competition going out. You know, the problem is we used to play small pickup games, play 3v3 basketball on the street. You know, obviously we played organized. Every sport was organized, but you also spent that time on your own, whether it was with a soccer ball, dribbling around, kicking it against uh, a wall, shooting baskets all day long. You know, those are the type of things as a kid you can do on your own for hours and hours and really see the results. And, you know, it's – in these days it doesn't seem to be uh, as prevalent, you know, but in the end that's the way. You know, you got to look at someone like Michael Jordan who never really played until he was a sophomore in high school and look at how far he took himself. If you really want to do it, you're willing to dedicate and be a student of the game and really work on the fundamentals, uh, you know, hopefully over six, 12 months, a year or two, you accelerate and you've got the gift uh, and you've got the mindset to keep getting better and keep pushing yourself and keep jumping up to the next level. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I know I definitely kicked the ball against the wall probably a million times. So yeah. I, uh, I definitely hear you there. Um, and I think uh, for me personally, like I went to Brazil when I was eight. I didn't play soccer before that at all. So when I get there, everyone and their dog plays soccer. On, uh, you know, school, at school during during break, you get like an hour break everyone goes out to the soccer field to play and like you want to make friends you gotta play soccer or else you're gonna be you know by yourself um so i think like that aspect of it that's yep, one of the things it's, it's uh it's survival of the fittest it's survival of the fittest right 
you have to be uh, you have to get out there and stick your nose out there and uh, get involved or no one's going to give you the ball you got to go out there and fight for it and uh, I kind of had a target on my back too because I was an American so they're like oh we want to put it through that guy's legs all the time <laughs> but uh but I, I do love the fact that soccer unites people and, and, you know, you can go into a soccer field and know one person on the soccer field in like a pickup game. And in two hours, by the end of that two hours, you've got like 15 new best friends. Yeah, uh, that's always, uh, you know, the universal language. Step out on any park, park field or on the beach somewhere. And, you know, nowadays you're going to, find someone with a soccer ball you jump in that's that's the beauty of it yes yes that's that's definitely one of the things that made me fall in love with the sport um let's talk about uh leadership at your academy how do you develop leaders i know you you brought you said you bring in these two uefa coaches in um how do you like you know start to mold the culture of your academy um what are some of the values you try to instill in your academy well, as, as a leader, I, I think there's two aspects. Uh, number one is, you know, your work ethic and your, your, your desire to be a, a positive role model. And, uh, you know, that's by your work ethic, your dedication to the sport, the energy and enthusiasm you bring, and uh, your knowledge and your preparation, right? All those things that a, a kid or pro player says, hey, this guy, number one, he knows what he's talking about, but he's professional. He's organized. He's passionate about it. He's able to think the game session, run a team together. You know, half the battle is can you identify players and pick players and mold them into a successful team? But I think the other big thing is, number one, it's your, it's your communication ability. You know, do you can you communicate your ideas and can you teach and also can you kind of communicate your standards and your values and your your qualities and say hey this is a fantastic game everybody has a role to play if we're responsible to each other and we respect the game and we respect each other and we're willing to go out there and sacrifice and for the for the team you know that that type of culture, it's hard to, it's hard to find. You got to do it first of all by the character, of the people you pick. You know, when you're talking youth academy, it's, you know, there's no time to be worried about who's got the ball, who's scoring goals, what position you play. You got to get into all, all think. I, I have a role to play. It's an important role. I can really do a lot to help this team win. And then you got to kind of keep a a work ethic there but communication is also between the players on the field either they're all going in one direction and they don't really say and do much they don't really learn from each other or they really buy in and they're always talking and trying to get better and learning and and kind of self-coaching themselves and self-coaching the team uh, you know they've got to take responsibility for that it's not like a, a basketball coach or a football coach who can draw up every play and kind of dictate where the ball goes and how it goes. You know, there's a lot of thinking, there's a lot of responsibility that every player needs to take to be a, a part of a soccer team. So that's half the battle. Are the kids engaged? Are the players engaged? Are they in it? And are they working hard with each other to, uh, you know, to do all the things you talk about, all the ideals of sport, all the things it takes to be a good competitive team. And, you know, as a pro player, you realize, yeah, I won, a, I won three or four championships, but over 14 years, there are plenty of times when we didn't win anything and we didn't make the playoff. And you still have to bring it every day. You still show up ready to train. You're prepared. You're healthy. You're fit. You're mentally ready to go. You know, that's – there's only one – if there's 20 teams in the league, there's only one team that can win the championship. But the other 19 teams – can they develop a culture where they're out there every day getting something, getting something out of uh, being a part of a team that's trying to compete at a high level? 
Yeah, um, that's all, all great stuff you, uh, you talked about. Taking responsibility definitely is, is you know, a huge part of, of uh, you know, building, building something big. Um, you have to really, you know, accept your, your, your failures and, and embrace them. Well, really, yeah, what it is, is you're, you've got to accept responsibility for development, right? The coach cannot go out there and perform all the skill work and the technique work. He can only spend so much time with every of the, you know, there's 18, 20 players on a team. How much time can you really devote to any one guy at a time? You know, one or two or three. You watch the big picture a lot. The players have to understand that they're the ones that are in the end are responsible for their own development. And some of them really take it seriously and they go the extra mile to every part of their game and every part of their, uh, you know, their, their personality and their attitude and their commitment. You know, there's, there's not a lot of coaches that, uh, you know, you can you can inspire them and motivate them a little bit, but you can't actually go out and do the work for them. They have to go do the work for themselves. I'm sure um, you've come across this where a lot of the the I don't know maybe newer players they're they're so much more focused on like not screwing up and not losing their place that they kind of forget the big picture. And you know, how do you help them deal with those nerves and that pressure of um, you know, focus on doing well versus don't screw up. Yeah, you know, mistakes, mistakes are fine. And the good thing about soccer is it's, you know, there's only two, three, four goals scored out of 90 minutes. So there's a lot of mistakes going on there. It's not like you come down and you shoot 30, 40, 50% and you make half your shots, you know, so it's, it's natural that the ball is turned over, over and over again. So the question is, do you learn how to minimize your mistakes and do you get better at it? You know, we're all out there trying to improve our technique, improve our decision making. Um, but there's the only thing bad about making mistakes is either if you don't learn from it or if it distracts you and you lose your concentration and you just become, you know, kind of like a black hole out there. You know, everyone's going to have a rough day and have a, a rough period in the game. But if you're focused and you're engaged and you're still working hard and you're still doing all the other parts of your game that helps the team win, then, you know, players can overlook physical and, 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 and mental mistakes. But as a teammate and as a, you know, your attitude and your character and your, your loyalty to your teammates, it's very obvious, you know, I might make, I might not have the ability or the speed or the, tactical intelligence of another player, but if I can perform a certain role for the team and do that well all the time, then you have uh, a lot of value to the team. But if you are the one that you make a couple mistakes, you go into a shell and you get tentative and you have a bad attitude and you stop working, you know, those things are obvious to your teammates. So there's nothing wrong with making mistakes if, number one, you try your best to minimize those mistakes and improve so you don't make those mistakes but also you're always always trying to do everything you can mentally and physically to help the team win as a player would you ever you know get stuck in your head after making a mistake and then did you learn how to cope better with that and what were those coping skills you learned like was there an improvement process there or were you always going to just kind of like Next ball, well, next ball. The, the, the first thing is when you make a mistake, can you immediately go, you know, let's say you gave a bad pass. Can you either immediately go and, and, and fix that situation and go win the ball back or whatever? Um, but the key to, to getting better is when you realize that you make a certain mistake and if you repeat them, is can you recognize the pattern and then either – do something different physically with your skill or your technique, or if you just make a decision so that you never put yourself into that situation again. So I think that's one thing that mentally, the, 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 the decision-making process, how you simplify your game so you play to your strengths. If you can play to your strengths, then you'll make less mistakes. You're doing the same things that you know you're good at and you know you can do over and over again. 
it's the players that don't realize, hey, I'm really not that good of a dribbler when there's two guys on me. I should avoid that situation all the time. Only dribble when you're at the, in the advantage and you know you you can beat the guy every time. You know, there's the same players who make the same mistakes, take the same bad shots all the time, you know, lose the ball because they're not prepared or they're, they're not willing to get rid of the ball quick enough before the other team closes them down and, and takes the ball from them. You know, it's really about how do you think the game. So it's not so much about the physical part of making a mistake. It's the mental mistakes and the decision-making mistakes. So, you know, obviously at a certain level, it's, it's the fundamentals. But, you know, I, that's something I learned early on in college from Bob Bradley is to, you know, analyze every play you make. And if you see a pattern that you're making the same mistakes, it's probably not just that you're making a physical mistake, but it's because you're not – you're putting yourself in a situation to fail and you need to change the way you think and, and avoid those situations and keep putting yourself in situations where you know you're going to succeed. That little nugget of advice is priceless. I have never heard it put that way. And I love that. And that, that can be used in, in life too. So many Absolutely. aspects of life. Um, do you do mental – when you were a player, did you use mental rehearsal and visualization? Yes. I mean, there's – you know, one of the things about the coaching licenses is you got to really understand how people learn, how kids learn. You know, they always say to us in the pro license, you're teaching, but is anyone learning anything? You have to – Take yourself out of your own shoes and look at it from the from the athlete's perspective and say, am I being an effective communicator? Do they really under – and you have to test that. You can say it to your blue in the face. You can demonstrate it 20 times. You can watch video. But if you don't actually test them and say, hey, can you, you know, tell it back to me? Do you understand what's going on here? Are you guys – is there actual learning going on? You know, that's an important thing. You know, as a player, I got to a fairly high level of reading the game and making quick decisions and holding many variables in your head and being able to react and, and, and execute plays off of the way you read the game. Well, the way I describe something and the way I think something is not the way everybody thinks about it. So you have to, as a coach, say, hey, I can't teach you how I do it. I have to teach the team so they can all understand it. So, you you know, we talk about having a very clear principles of the game, sub-principles of the game, and then rules. So that – because everybody's a little bit different, whether it's the physical or the mental aspect of the games and the way they learn and the way they – some people learn by visually. Some people learn only, you know, by physically doing it. Other people can, look, you know, a little bit of video or verbally take it on board. As coaches, we try and do everything verbally. You know, you gotta, you got to be creative. you got to figure out. And it, also, it takes time, mm -hmm. right? No, no, no team, you can't get everybody on the same page and have perfect learning. Most of the concepts that, that you're trying to get out there, they take months or weeks. So you have to be creative. You have to keep repeating it. Yes, visualization is good. I think the visualization is good for – watching the patterns and reading the patterns and recognizing the patterns and also for technique, the technical work, you know, but the technical work players really got to break it down for themselves. They got to watch people, other people do it, try and pick out the one or two things that they can recognize that, that can help them. Everyone, everyone's got a bit different body type, you know, different shape. Some are short, some are tall. You got to make the moves and the technical aspects of the game you got to make it your own and that only comes through breaking it down and practicing it over and over again yeah some people have a giant clown feet and some people have little tiny baby feet and yeah. uh, you, you can't try to emulate someone with baby feet if you have giant clown feet it just doesn't work right you know the beauty of it is when you watch pro soccer on tv Everybody, the pudgy kids, the fast kids, the short kids, the 
stocky kid, the tall, gangly guy, the big muscle-bound guy, they're all able to be successful. There's no stereotype for soccer. You know, I think that's the one thing that makes it such an easy game for kids to fall in love with because you don't have to be the tallest, fastest guy. There's so much skill involved. There's so much the mental aspects, the, the reading of the game and the technical, you know, the, sorry, the tactical decision making that, that covers up the physical aspects of the game. Yes, you've got to be committed. You've got to be an athlete. If you want to be a pro player, you've got to be really good at some things physically, right? You can't, you can't be deficient in all areas, but you don't have to be uh, an Olympic sprinter to be successful at soccer. You've got to have good movement, good anticipation. Most importantly, it's speed of speed of your mental play more than the speed of your, you know, physical speed. Yeah, a, a great example of the no stereotype is uh, you look at Peter Crouch, who is a great forward, and then you look at Romario from Brazil, who was, you know, yeah, short. Yeah, I mean, I look, I look at Peter Crouch and say, how is a guy who's almost six foot six play with? I mean, he still looks awkward and gangly no matter what. But at the highest level, he was able to do all of the skill pieces, not just the heading, the receiving the ball, the turning of the ball, the, the laying it off, making passes, giving goes. You know, wasn't a fantastic dribbler, but had all the tech, you know, put, put the ball on target with the side foot, with the, with the laces, volleys, receiving the ball. He was, you would never think someone hit that tall could be so silky smooth and, you know, just... I would say almost underrated how skillful he was. You know, you knew everyone thinks of him as a great goal scorer with his head, but he really, I mean, he really brought the whole package. It's amazing to see. And it's like you said, you could be five foot four and be an absolute quickness and speed demon and tricky and ultra skillful Romario, or you could be six foot six, complete opposite qualities physically, but just as effective in his own way. You know, and and I think it comes down to what you said before, that belief. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was always, when I stepped on the field for a game, whether it was a scrimmage or a college game or a pro game or a high, high-level pro game, you're, you know, there's no hiding. You know how your week of training went. You know how your last month went. You know what physical and mental form you're in. You don't expect to have a perfect game, but you're like, no matter what happens, if there's 10 categories in the game, I'm firing on eight or nine or 10 categories at all times. I might drop off and, you know, get beat here on defense, might not have my best passing game or might have missed a cross or a shot here and there. But you all, you know before you step on the field, am I, am I prepared, am I ready to go, go out here and, and perform? And that's what gives you the belief. If you don't work hard enough and you come out and you're looking around and you're not confident that you can deal with anything that's going on across the, across the line from the other team, that's where the doubt creeps in. You know, that's where, that's where I said it, you got to play to your strengths. If I know that I do what I do well over and over and over again, I know I'm going to have a successful game. I might not score all the goals. I might not be the, you know, the stopper who marks the other best player, but that belief comes from the hard work and the preparation. Yeah, it's the, it's the foundation of everything. All right, my last question to you, David. If you could go back in time and tell your 16-year-old, 18-year-old self one piece of advice, what would you say? Um, well, the only career advice I would have stayed over in uh, in Italy or stayed in Mexico the, the, the two times I went over there, didn't know any better, didn't have any advisors. As difficult as it was where it looked like there's no prospects, I could have stayed there and been a, been a second division player in Italy or a second division player in Mexico and probably would have adju adjusted like I did at MLS and made it. You just, it's, you've got to put yourself into – the best competitive situation against the best players possible. And 
every time I went from Connecticut to New Jersey, and I went from Connecticut to New Jersey playing with Tab Ramos and John Harks and Tony Miola and these guys. And then you go to college, you're a 17 year old freshman, you play against 22 and 23 year old international players. And then when you jump up to the pros, you know, you could be playing against a 30 year old guy who's played in two or three world cups. And, you know, you always have to put yourself in the absolute most competitive environment possible. And, uh, you know, that's my only regret is not having had the advice or the counsel or the, uh, someone gave, you know, walk me into the opportunity and say, Hey, you're good enough to stay here in Italy. You can play second or third division, but if you're good enough, you know, you'll, you'll work your way up. You'll be able to get a contract. And that's the only, uh, change of advice. Obviously there's, you know, contract negotiation here, pick this team over this team. But in general, that's the only, you know, thing you look on is like, I wish I had done this. Gotcha. No, it's, it's uh, definitely important to put yourself in, because, you know, the, the quickest or the road of least resistance is usually what gets taken the most. And you're not going to grow if you do that. You've got to put yourself in, you know, those most competitive environments or, you know, like in your case. Well, David, it has been an honor and a pleasure to talk to you and get to know yeah, you. Yeah, Brandon, and awesome. I, uh, I think uh, my listeners will get a lot of value from this. I know um, I help coach the uh, Roger State men's soccer team, and I know there's several nuggets of, of uh, good knowledge here that, that I'm going to share with them. Um, yeah, sure. Is there a way you can send me a file with it at some course. point of course. When, you, when you edit it? Of course. All right, cool. Awesome. If you see Shannon, tell her I said hello. Sounds good. All I'll right, Brandon, I appreciate it. Let's practice, and uh, I will be in touch with you, David. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye.